Good afternoon, Cameron Bikondova. <laughs> Welcome on VH Berries. Hi, thank you for having me. I am extremely grateful. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. Um, I have a bit of a headache, but I just ate, so I think it should go away soon. <laughs> but how are you? I'm doing great because 150 is the number associated with this conversation. And it also might be uh, the speed, 150 miles per hour, uh, that you are going to reach probably with the Puma Catwoman limited edition shoes that you got two days ago from Lori. <laughs> yes, and um, I, there was a bit of a mishap too. Puma themselves ended up sending me a pair, so now I have two pairs, so maybe I can go double the speed with two different pairs of shoes. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about these extraordinary stories? Um, yeah, I so I met my good friend Lori through the show Gotham that I was on. And she was my first stunt woman. Um, then she had an accident on a different set that prevented her from being my stunt woman ever again. But we became really close where I consider her a sister and she found out that Puma has a collaboration with Batman or I don't even know exactly what it is I just know that it's a Catwoman edition shoe um and so she texted me the other day and she was like sis you have to have it I'm gonna email them and uh Lori the best way that I can describe her is she is a woman of faith and a big dreamer and sometimes um, I just, sometimes I just kind of go along with her dreams, <laughs> but I really didn't think that she would get a response from Puma, but she did. And they ended up sending me a pair of shoes. <laughs> and I'm just like, the craziest things happen to this woman in the best and worst ways. And in this case, um, she, helped me, she helped me get blessed with a contact from Puma and some new shoes. So I'm excited to wear them. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, Cameron Bikondova, being, as you just mentioned, a big dreamer also means to make a great footstep. And this is perfect because we're always staying in the shoes vocabulary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, I think that's, that's, it's a it's a blessing and I guess it's a blessing and a curse to being a creative person or even in some cases an entrepreneurial person like you for example you are on your 150th episode of a podcast and it takes so much effort to schedule and buy equipment and then edit and all of that um and it's it's a blessing and a curse to be in that position because it every little step um, creates progress and leads you closer to your goal or your dream. But then so it's, it can get exhausting because it's like, dang, how many steps do I have to take to, to reach this goal or to, to get to that place where you want to be? So it's a blessing and a curse to be a dreamer for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. There are always those two um, sides uh, of uh, uh, that uh, uh, coin. And right. shoes in the, is an art as well as, uh, as the Bikondova Gallery. Yes. That, so that's definitely something in progress. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to share the name of it yet just because it's still so deep into development that um, I'm not exactly sure when it will launch, um, but it will be an online gallery um, that will essentially it's a way for me to kind of touch on all of the things that are important to me like art and um, expression and philanthropy. So it's a it's it will start off as a, um, an outlet for me to um, sell original paintings, prints of photography, poetry, um, and then I want to incorporate 
my philanthropy passion, my philanthropic passions as well. So proceeds will be going to charities of my choice that um, help children, whether they're underprivileged or sick, be able to express themselves through um, through art, whether it's through writing or photography or painting. Um, so it'll 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 be a gallery that people can come and either make direct purchases of of pieces that I've created or um, help benefit help other children that you know they might not know um, be able to benefit from the arts like I have benefited from them. So hopefully it's projected to launch in August of this year, but um, it's still deeply in development in development so that's something that i'm really excited about absolutely uh, cameron bicondova because uh, this gallery as you just mentioned will uh, showcase uh, your original paintings uh, as well as some poetry and in definitive, the art uh, likewise allows you to express yourself in a more informal context and settings. And I can make a direct parallel um, to the beginning of your journey uh, as a military brat, which is in a more formal settings. Yes, yes. Um, my life has been full of extreme contrasts. Um, I, <laughs> I was raised by <laughs> two, it's, it's so wild. Um, and then I have people <laughs> close to me who are like, why are you so extreme? And I'm like, my life has been full of extremes. I don't know, please don't blame me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was raised by two military people, um, both in the Navy and was, you know, very, uh, very strict household, um, at times volatile for sure. Um, but so it was, it, it was, how do I say this? For example, um, there were very strict rules and expectations at home, but I never lived in one house for longer than maybe two years. So there's that contrast of, you know, being very disciplined in one way of living, but very scattered in other in other ways of living, or even very disciplined in fitness where, you know, I would be taking on six mile runs to work out, but then have the freedom of um, expression through dance too. Or once I moved to New York for Gotham um, in my teenage years, it was also very... <laughs> very extreme contrasts because I had the independence of being a teenager in a city like New York where, you know, I'm taking public transportation, I'm going to work on my own, I, you know, I was making my own money so I could pay, you know, well, that's a totally different, there's a totally different contract, there's a totally different story with that, but, you know, the contrast <laughs> of um, being independent while also being in a very um, suffocating, uh, relationship at home. So my life has been very, like, so full of contradictions that I can barely make sense of, let alone really explain to someone else that's not a therapist, maybe. <laughs> um, but that has given me, uh, that's given me the opportunity to seek expression through art forms like dance, like acting, um, and like writing and poetry and photography. With dance, I can use my body and express my emotions without having to use words. And with acting, I can tap into emotions that I wouldn't otherwise really tap into by using words. Um, and then everything that will, everything that I love about the, the silent art forms, um, not to be repetitive, but writing, poetry, photography, um, or uh, photography, painting. Um, it's also a silent art form. And I've essentially all of that to say, um, I, I know what it's like to be a child um, and not really know 
what to communicate or how to communicate um, and and be in a position where, uh, how do I say? I know I know what it's like to be a child who only really knows how to communicate through art. Um, so essentially I, I want to start to use my platform to give other children that opportunity that might not be able to, whether it's because of health issues or toxic um, uh, living situations, um, toxic relationships, maybe financially it's not affordable. So that's really that's really what um, drove my um, idea for opening the gallery is yes to express myself and be able to sell my my pieces, but mainly to create uh, a, a place that I can give back in a way that I know how. If that makes sense. Absolutely, Cameron Bikondova. And on one hand, there is that uh, volatility that you just mentioned. But on the other side, there is this very uh, powerful uh, US uh, subculture, including that uh, cultural identity and lifestyle that I assume is giving you a lot of discipline. Yes, um, being a it's very interesting though because a lot of people at least when i have mentioned bits of my childhood and how it was kind of non-existent um <laughs> how a lot of people assume that it's because my parents were in the military or because i stepped into um the entertainment industry at a young age um but it really wasn't that i mean being raised by two military parents is unique in itself and being in the industry is um, unique in itself. But um, I guess I don't think I'm answering your question. Um, what's your question? I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's perfect because I had no question about it. Oh, it was just nuts. an observation. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Then yes, that's a very, very good observation. <laughs> In definitive, uh, Cameron by Condova, your comfort zone was the HNC, Hawaii, New York, California. I'm only saying the name of the states because inside those states you moved on multiple places for example in california there is los angeles but also san diego <laughs> yeah it's, i i joke because i joke i've always joked that i'm uh i've always been a bit of a gypsy because like i said earlier i never lived in one apartment for longer than two years maybe until i moved to new york Um, but even then, <laughs> I was in that one apartment for three years. So it was only like one year <laughs> difference. Um, so I've never, um, yeah, I was born in San Diego. Um, and then I was raised there until right after my 10th birthday. Um, I turned 10 in May. And then in August, we moved to Kaneohe, which is um, in Oa on Oahu, Hawaii. And then about two years after that, um, <laughs> I decided to pursue my professional dance career and decided to start going back and forth between Hawaii and L.A. Um, so that was around the time I was 11 or 12 years old. Um, and then by the time I was 12 years old, we were back in L.A. for my professional dance career. And then... Um, and then... Two years after that, after auditioning and training and acting, was when I found out I needed to move to New York. So that happened when I was 14 and then was in New York for five years and then moved back to San Diego and then now I'm back in L.A. Um, so, huh, yeah, it has been a ride. It has been a ride. It has been a long ride, Cameron Bikondova. But secretly, maybe HNC, G, 
<laughs> G for Gotham City. A yeah, H N C. I like that. <laughs> I like your abbreviation, Victor. H N C G. Um yeah, Gotham. <laughs> I am so thankful. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that was um yeah. And not many the what blows my mind even still to this day, which it blew my mind then and it'll it'll it blows my mind now was that um I was the seventh woman to or young woman at the time, but seventh person to play Selena Kyle in history. Um, but I was the first to play her at that age. And I don't know, it's just, it's just so wild to me. Even like three years later, three years after it stopped airing, I'll walk down the street. Like the other day, I was walking, um, to a Starbucks and there was a woman who was, who she recognized me. And it was just, it was the weirdest. I don't know. It, it's just so wild to me that people still, occasionally know who I am um yeah I don't know I don't know if I'll ever get used to it and broadly speaking Cameron Bikondova to travel you obviously need to have a very great and solid suitcase that suitcase that you can put in the Batmobile <laughs> <laughs> yes always need a solid suitcase I would love to discuss about um, these experiences playing that legendary character that is called Selina Kyle. Can you tell us about how it all began uh, before you were uh, auditioning? How was the environment around you? Oh, um, bef like when I was auditioning? How it got all started. Ah, ah. Um... Yeah, so I was living in LA. Um, I was dancing not as often as I was before, but I was still dancing, um, still training and acting. And um, I got i i was I was a freshman in high school. Um, it was my first year back in public school after being uh, homeschooled through online for some years, and. I was, I was going on audition after audition after audition, and there was just, there were no bites. I mean, no bites at all. Um, and I was starting to get very discouraged, and I also knew the pressure that my family was on, um, paying two rents off of one income. And when I was professionally dancing and actually working, I was pretty much the breadwinner of the family, um, or at least definitely the one I was heavily contributing to the income for our family. So I knew that me not working was causing a strain. And I was just, I had been going on audition after audition, um, just getting so discouraged because I was like, well, how are we going to pay rent? Like, how, how is this going to work? Am I going to have to move back to San Diego and live this normal life and have to make new friends? And, you know, I, I was just so discouraged and I was starting to silently think, okay, well, um, I was starting to think, well, I think I'm done with this acting thing. I think that you know, I'll just give it another month. And if I don't book anything, then I'll tell my parents I don't want to do it anymore. And I was just kind of going through the motions. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, the, my agent at the, or my manager at the time got, uh, she saw, uh, um, a breakdown for a character for this pilot. And she said, Oh, Cameron, you have to go out for this one. You have to go out for this one. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you know, like, you know, this orphan named Lucy, who's a firecracker. I was like, okay, I'll go on this audition, but nothing's going to happen from it. So I like put on my happy face and I went to my acting coach and we worked through it. And I felt actually really good about it. I felt it was the first audition that I was genuinely confident going into. 
um, which was surprising given that I had just, I was strongly considering quitting. Um, and I walked in to the audition and I saw this one other um, teenage girl who she was notorious for intimidating people in the waiting room, um, playing loud music in her headphones or humming or just doing anything to distract the other girls in the room. And I remember recognizing her and thinking, hmm, I got this. Um, and <laughs> I don't even I don't even know if she ended up um, I don't know if she's still acting, but Anyway, I went into the audition, I killed it, and then they, um, <laughs> I mean, I did, I, I killed it, and they asked me back for a callback, but this time they said, don't wear the bomber jacket, because I, I, I wore my favorite bomber jacket ever, and so they said the second time they wanted to see my physique, so um, the second time I went in, I didn't wear a bomber jacket, and then um, after that, I didn't hear anything. And I was just going to school every day, just wondering, okay, are you kidding me? Like, if I don't get this, this is ridiculous. Like, I'm really quitting now because I know I killed that audition. And if I don't get it, like, I'm really quitting. And so just day after day after day going to school and just waiting to hear any sort of response. Um, and then finally I found out that I got a producer session, which... You know, when you get a producer session, you are just not even a full step closer. You're like just a toe squeeze closer to getting the job. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I got a producer session. I have a week to prepare. Um, and the only change that they asked of was that I prepare a set of cat movements. And they said it wasn't mandatory. But, you know, if you want a job, you'll do it. And so... I spent the entire week leading up to it um, just perfecting the lines, but watching... I had a cat at the time. His name was Mr. G, and he was my best friend. And um, I would stalk him, and when he was napping, I'd clap, and I'd see how he would jump. Um, I'd watch him run. I'd watch him walk. I'd wa I'd play with him more, and I'd wa I watched uh, videos of literal cats fighting on youtube i watched videos of uh cats the musical and i created um i i was able to use my dance background to choreograph uh, a, a piece where essentially the concept that i came up with was that i was a cat hunting a, a bird um and then i created a set of cat movements um and then i filmed it <laughs> I, I actually found the video i i i've been trying to figure out if I should post it or not but I went to my neighbor's <laughs> apartment she had roof she had a roof and she had these big AC units and I asked her if I could have access to her rooftop so that I could film this audition basically and so in the video I'm jumping to and from these big AC units and then onto the floor and I'm doing all these crazy things and then um I took when it was time to actually go into the producer session, um, I was, it was on the Warner Brothers lot in a screening area, and obviously they didn't have an AC unit in the theater, because, I mean, obviously. So I asked them to, I asked them if I could have a chair, and they were like, a chair? You need a chair? And I said, yeah. Um, and so I jumped off of the chair instead of, uh, I jumped off of the chair and then I sat on it for the audition. Um, and it was just Danny Cannon and then Bruno Heller and then the casting director. They were all in there. Um, and I just remember leaving feeling just so sure that I got it. And then I still had to wait like two weeks before I heard anything. Um, and then, yeah, and then um, I, I found out that I got the job after school one day. Um, my parent picked me up, drove me to my manager's house, and um, they, they wouldn't tell me anything. They just basically were mute and just put me in my then manager's office. And then they, someone called 
I don't even, I still to this day don't know who it was on the phone. I don't know if it was my then agent or if it was someone for, like I have no idea who told me this, but they were like, they literally answered the phone and all they said was meow. And I was like, what? <laughs> and here I am, like, I don't know that I'm auditioning for Catwoman. I'm so naive. I don't, I, I don't know. I just think I'm auditioning for Lucy and I happen to have to choreograph cat movements. And um, <laughs> they were like, are you ready? Like, you're playing Catwoman. I said, what? Um, so, yeah, and there were some details that I left out just because it, the, it might, I mean, I was already super detailed about it. But, um, yeah, that's how I, that's, that was the auditioning process and, and um, what, and the, the, how I found out that I got it. So it was pretty insane and then within i think a week or so i was already in new york filming the pilot so it was a really it was a really long waiting process but a really a really quick turnaround it was a very quick turnaround <laughs> and cameron uh Bekandova, uh there is obviously a very ironic fact which is that right now you have a cat So I don't have a cat. So my the the prof the profile photo, um, it's a funny story. That cat is just a cat that I bonded with on a trip that I took to a family friend's ranch, and we stayed in their guest house while they were doing construction. And the story is that the previous owners of the home had a cat, and then they moved. And even though they brought the cat with them, the cat refused to leave the house. So they moved like miles and miles away. Um, but the cat walked, however, the distance, um, he walked back to the house and just refuses to leave. So the cat that's on my profile photo, or that is my profile photo, is just a cat that I befriended on a trip. <laughs> and, um, it's not mine. <laughs> I wish he was mine, but he's not mine. Absolutely. That cat was very sad uh, by having his back uh, in front of the wall because he was too attached to that home. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I wanted to bring him home so badly, but then I was like, well, he's not leaving this home because he doesn't want to. So can't put him in the car, Cameron, <laughs> leave him here. Um, yeah. So I don't have a cat right now, but... I did have one. And Cameron Bikondova, uh, I really like just before when you explained that you were um, thinking of quitting and that it was in definitive one of your last chance. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and it wasn't something that I vocalized to my manager at the time or my parents. It was very much an internal commitment internal commitment that I made where I was like okay if this I, I if this doesn't if this audition doesn't work then no I'm I'm really done I really I can't I can't handle it anymore um and just by the grace of God seriously it was like this this audition came in that and that was the other thing too that was so annoying and exhausting was I never saw myself as a Disney kid. There's no shame in being a Disney kid. Disney kids turn out to be very successful artists in the industry. Um, so I don't, I'm not saying it because of that. It's just, I always, I saw myself as more of a network television actor or a feature film actor. I never saw myself as someone who fit into the Disney or Nickelodeon character, like caricature, because Yeah, it just didn't seem like me. And I was always too edgy for them. And that was always the note that these casting directors would give me. And I was like, so why am I still going on these auditions? Like, the only auditions I was really getting was for Disney and Nickelodeon. And I was like, what the heck? Like, I don't fit into that mold. And every audition I'm going to, I'm going on, it leads to a no. So what is the point? Like, what is the point? Why can't I get an edgy role on a solid network or a solid film? Like, why, why, what, 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 what the heck? What the heck? And <laughs> that's part of, that's part of what was so annoying was like, not only am I getting rejected, but I'm getting rejected for things that I don't even want to do. So... 
what really is the point here? And that's really what led to me wanting to quit was how exhausting it was for roles that I wasn't even really excited about. They would really just be a paycheck. And so when the breakdown came in for Selena, which I only knew to be Lucy, it was like, oh, it, it, it was kind of a, it was like a light at the end of the tunnel where it was finally an audition for a role that I knew I could fit in and I knew I could kill and I knew I could, um, I had a really solid chance at. Um, so I went, I, you know, um, and I remember too, after, um, so every, this is also kind of a sidetrack, but if, before every audition I would go on, I would train with my late coach. His name was Richard. And, um, sometimes I would leave those auditions still feeling a little nervous. And I remember before the audition, I, I met with him and literally the morning of, um, my audition was at, I think, noon, and I met with him at 10 in the morning. And we ran it one time, and he said, go get him, kid. And I just, I remember it was the first and only audition where I genuinely felt confident about. Um, and I guess it, I mean, it showed in my work because they ended up hiring me. But yeah, if it weren't for Gotham, I don't think I would be acting still to this day. I really don't think I would. You always had that small light at the end of the tunnel, uh, Cameron Bicondova. Yeah. And it was not the first time that you were uh, facing those choices because choices are part of the life of every superhero. <laughs> and this time I am talking about an ultimatum, as you like to call it, when um, you were uh, even younger concerning dancing. Yes. Um, so I was a professional dancer from the time that I was, I'd say, 11 to 14. Um, well, actually, probably, it actually probably only lasted a year or two. Um, yeah, I got my, I got, yeah. From like 10 and a half to 13. Um, cause I still continued working when I could in dancing when I was starting to act. But, um, yeah, I, I, dance was always my passion. The only real goal that I had for <laughs> later in my life was to go on tour with an artist. Um, I ended up not being able to achieve that dream, but, I, I only ever saw myself as a dancer. And when it was time for me to take acting more seriously, everyone in the industry told me that I needed to, um, basically I needed to stop dancing if I was going to take it seriously, which was hard because at like up until that point, dancing was all I ever knew and all I ever wanted to do. So to go from training five hours a day, that's, a, that's not a dramatization either, like five hours a day to nothing was a really big deal. Um, and with Gotham, I was actually able to basically say suck it because I was able to use my dancing background and it actually made the job that much easier and that much more fun because I was able to Come the third season of the show, I was able to actually collaborate with the stunt coordinators um, in choreographing some of my own stunt fight uh, fight scenes and and stunt scenes. So, um, yeah, I had to I had to I was faced with a really big a lot of really big decisions at a young age, um, and one of them was the possibility of quitting dance, which thank God didn't end up happening because the main job that made a lot of people a lot of money uh, needed my dance background. So, um, yeah, yeah. And as the date of today, you're feeling good in your shoes. Those Puma Catwoman hey. 
limited edition shoes. Thank you very much, Cameron uh, Bicondova, and thank you very much to your friend, Alexandro, who <laughs> helped you behind the camera. Yeah, I think he's napping. Na oh, no, he's awake. Uh, yes, he says thank you to <laughs> you for helping. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and um and to be on your 150th guest is a really big deal. So, I appreciate it so much and I hope you have a good rest of your day.